Part 1. Disease. Burnout as a status symbol. We are so busy, usually too busy for God. Leonard Sweet. Chapter 1. Dead Husband Walking. There is more to life than increasing its speed. Mahatma Gandhi. Fighting Healthy Rhythms. I began fighting what I call rhythmic living, living intentionally, sanely, and at peace, at an early age. The childhood version of me was a boy who was always moving, always doing, and always lacking appreciation for rest. There was a horse to ride through the woods, and there were deer to hunt and fish to catch. What use was slowing down and reflecting on things when all this life was waiting to be lived? As I morphed into a teenager, my pace only intensified. I was born with a heart condition and found I had to work twice as hard as my buddies in order to achieve the same sports-related goals. So I pushed, 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 insisting my body run faster, go farther, and play harder. Intellectually, I was exactly the same way. I pushed just as hard in both high school and college always hungering and thirsting for more information, more knowledge, more understanding of this thing called life. I wasn't naturally smart, but I was naturally curious. Curiosity dictated my pace in life, and curiosity never sits down. My wife Pam and I married when we were 22, and within five years I was running my life at unprecedented speeds, even for me. We lived in Shreveport, Louisiana at the time where I taught junior and senior level English literature at Evangel Christian Academy, a prep school with several hundred children. That role alone would have meant a full plate for me, but I treated it as a mere side dish, adding to it half a dozen other appetizing things. I was the boys' varsity basketball coach. I was the girls' varsity basketball coach. I was the boys' JV basketball coach and also the junior high boys' basketball coach. I was the high school track and field coach, one of the campus pastors for the school, and the volunteer youth pastor at the church associated with the school. These combined commitments meant I was gone from six or seven in the morning until ten or eleven at night, teaching, conducting parent-teacher conferences, grading papers, tutoring students, leading practices, driving buses, coaching games, washing uniforms in the locker room's laundry facility, and more. During that season of life, the greatest compliment you could have paid me was, Wow, you're always so busy. To me, busyness equaled movement, and movement was necessary for me to get ahead. I had exactly one day off a week, which was Saturday, but even then I refused to rest. The pastor of the church where I served as volunteer youth pastor was a man twenty years my senior, a man I idolized to such an extent it bordered on unhealthy. I wanted to be this guy. He was, and remains, the best preacher I have ever heard, and was an all-around amazing man. One weekend he approached me and invited me to have breakfast with him the following morning. I was blown away that he would even talk to me, let alone want to spend time one-on-one. -on -one. I said yes immediately. In the early 1990s, the governor of Louisiana, Buddy Romer, had declared solving the crime problem in New Orleans and Shreveport as one of his primary initiatives. These cities were, at the time, among the top crime centers in the entire country. These were dark, dark places, and Governor Romer was determined to shine some light. He enlisted the aid of local church pastors to head up a volunteer crime-fighting force in the state's most dangerous, most vulnerable communities and my pastor happened to be one of the pastors involved. When I met him for breakfast at the diner on King's Highway, he said, Brady, Governor Romer would like our church to participate in fighting crime, and one of the ways I'd like to do that is by starting an adopt-a-block program. He grabbed a napkin from the plastic holder, reached for a pen from his shirt pocket, and began to scribble down his thoughts. He dictated as he wrote, Here's what I think the Lord is asking us to do. Let's take the most violent neighborhoods in our city and break them down into 20 home clusters. We ended up calling them parishes based on Louisiana's long-standing county line structure. He said, I'm going to go before the church and ask for families to adopt each of these parishes, but I need somebody to head up the whole thing. This is where you come in, Brady. 
I'd like you to administer the entire program, to organize whatever needs organizing, and see it all through to the end. I need you to go into all these neighborhoods, be my eyes and ears on the ground, sort out the urgency for me, determining which blocks require our attention most. I need you to tell me where our people need to be and how we can position ourselves most strategically to help reduce gang activity and crime in our state. I still have that napkin. That napkin meant the world to me because it was given to me on the day when one of my living heroes invited me into the game. The beloved pastor's vision for city renewal shapes my ministry still to this day. So he extended the offer, and of course I accepted. He needed me, after all. How I needed to be needed. This was an easy yes. Running to Save My Hide The first few weeks in my new role as the de facto kill-crime-not-each-other administrator were spent going on ride-alongs with various police officers who were accustomed to the high-crime beat. According to their assessment of things, the safest time of the week for me to be in these neighborhoods was from 8 until noon on Saturday mornings, when gang lords were still fast asleep. Saturday. My only day off. Saturday it was. During those car rides, my newfound police force friends would point out various houses and say such things as, That's where the twelve-year-old girl was raped last night. Here's where that murder yesterday took place. A couple of bloods live there. A few crips there. That's where the shooting happened. This sweet grandmother here has lost two grandkids to guns. She wants to move away, but where's she supposed to go? I didn't know these people yet, but their stories were tenderizing my heart. I wanted to rescue them, to save them, to deliver them from this sin-stained life. And so, with all the passion and energy I could muster, I began mapping out the most violent neighborhood, street by street by street, noting the most dangerous violators and most vulnerable residents. And then I came up with ideas for serving them both. When I finished mapping that first neighborhood, I began mapping the next. And when that one was completed, I started in on the third. On and on I went, organizing two hundred parishes in all. Our church eventually adopted 4,000 homes, and I became the steward over them all. Pam and I raised our hands, along with 199 other families, to adopt a block of these homes. And so every Saturday morning, we'd make our way to Abbey Street, knocking on doors, meeting our families, and, as time went on, serving them, praying with them, loving them, and meeting their needs as best we could. I would arrive early those Saturday mornings and teach outreach principles to all 200 church families who'd come to serve, and then we'd disband to visit our adopted families. Then, several hours later, after those morning visits were completed, we'd reconvene and celebrate and tell stories of what God had done. By the time Pam and I got home, it would be two in the afternoon. So from eight in the morning until mid-afternoon, year after year after year, this is how my day off got spent. It was a far cry from what Pam signed up for when she married me. During those first years of marriage, Pam probably envisioned lazy Saturday mornings, late breakfasts, a few hours to enjoy life as husband and wife. Instead, she got busyness, chaos, and a husband too distracted to see straight. Yes, she loved serving those folks on Abbey Street, and yes, she enjoyed being with me, even if we were busy. But she deserved better. She deserved more. She deserved better and more of me. House in Flames For four straight years I kept this pace, never stopping even to blink. In fact, whenever it seemed I might be able to slow my pace a bit, I let myself get roped into further busyness, which caused further strife at home. On one occasion during those years when I had been coaching all those teams, driving the athletic bus, washing the uniforms, the whole bit, the day came when basketball season was over, meaning I could finally catch a break. The day after the season ended, the school's athletic director called all of the head coaches into his office and explained he had fired the track coach that morning, for good reason, according to him. Baseball season was in full swing, so the baseball coach couldn't help out. 
Spring football had already begun, so the football coach couldn't help out, which left me. All eyes cut to me. Brady, the AD said, I need you to coach track. End of discussion. In a split second, my long-awaited dream of being home at 3.30 or 4 every afternoon vanished into thin air. I informed Pam of my new role, and not long after that, I came home to find that my wife of five years had packed her bags. I think her exact explanation was, if I'm going to be a single woman, I'd rather be single at my parents' house. Admittedly, it wasn't my best day. I was talking with a friend recently about this dark season from my past, and she asked, weren't there warning shots fired along the way? Translation, didn't you know what an idiot you were being? Yeah, I suppose the answer is yes, which proves it actually is possible to be too busy putting out other fires to notice your own house is going up in flames. My lovely and devoted wife would often ask if we could go on a date along the way, but who had time for that? A clear example comes to mind. Two weeks prior, on a rare Saturday when we didn't have parish ministry, Pam looked forward to spending time as a couple, just the two of us, with nothing on the agenda for an entire day. But that wasn't meant to be. I had been invited by a local soup kitchen to speak to their staff and guests, and because I didn't have any other obligations that day, I jumped at the opportunity to serve. It actually never occurred to me to invite Pam on a date or to plan together time for the day, it also never occurred to me to tell her of my plans at the soup kitchen. That Saturday morning, I got dressed, grabbed a piece of toast, and headed for the door. I quickly pecked Pam on the cheek as I mumbled a bread-crumbed goodbye, which is when I noticed there was no return greeting from my wife. There was nothing but an icy stare. You know that stare, the one that tells you that a time bomb is about to go off? It's not a good look to get. Wordlessly, she conveyed her furor over my making plans without her for the day, and in response, I wordlessly conveyed my furor over her failing to understand how much my ministry mattered to me. When the icy stare did give way to actual words, Pam said, You're not building God's kingdom. You're building the empire called Brady Boyd.